we'll start this course by considering fluvial or river environments because you're at least probably somewhat familiar with rivers and, and how they work. Our ultimate goal with this class is to use the characteristics of sedimentary rocks like the ones on the right um, to infer their original depositional environment. And that requires an understanding of the processes that operate in the modern environment, especially the movement and, and deposition of sediment and how those processes lead to the formation of diagnostic or characteristic sedimentary features. So this lecture covers the basics of river morphology, river types, and, and fluvial processes. Subsequent lectures will discuss sedimentary movement and sedimentary structures, and then we're going to bring those two topics together to generate models for relating ancient deposits to their depositional environments. Rivers occupy a fundamental place in sedimentology because they're the most important pathway for sediment transport from its source area to the ultimate location of deposition. Most sediment that we see in coastal areas was originally supplied by rivers, and it's originally produced by weathering and erosion or the breaking down of exposed rock by water or wind or ice. Um, sediment supply is really dominated by areas of steep topography such as mountains, but it does occur, erosion does occur in really all areas where you get exposed rock. The sediment that gets broken down from the rock is transported through the river systems before ultimately reaching the ocean and being deposited in coastal or other marine settings. However, some sediment does get left behind in rivers, and at times some of that sediment can be deposited permanently, it can also move through, which is called bypass, or the river could even be eroding sediment itself and not depositing. So first, some terminology to describe parts or components of river systems. Rivers flow through a floodplain, and that's the sort of flat area of the valley floor that's filled with sediments deposited by the river itself. The width of the floodplain you can see is marked in the photo of the right here. It's the area between the, the hill slopes with, with trees on it. Um, and likewise, on the left, it's kind of that the, the large area between the hills with trees. Um, within the rivers, the area where there's actively flowing water is called the channel. There could be more than one active channel, like in the photo on the left, or a single channel, single active channel, like the photo on, on the right. In rivers where you have a single sort of stable or permanent channel, the remaining area of the floodplain is called the overbank area. The overbank on the right is this flat area with the grass and the trees. Um, the river on the left does not have a clear separation between the channel and the overbank because the multiple channels that you can see there are constantly shifting in their positions. So these two photos also illustrate the two of the main categories of rivers, and that we braided rivers, the photo on the left, and meandering rivers, which is the photo on the right. And so we'll spend a few slides talking about them and, and what they look like and how they work. Braided rivers get their name from the multiple intertwined channels that resemble braided hair or, or rope. The individual braids have low sinuosity, which means that they don't bend or curve that much. They're relatively straight. And they're separated by these mid-channel bars. The raised bars, or these areas of, of sand or gravel, um, are exposed when the water level is low, but they're submerged when the river has higher water. And it's really when they're submerged that the, the sediment is actually moving. The individual braid channels shift their position quite frequently, so there isn't a clear distinction between the channel and the overbank area here. Uh, the channels also tend to be pretty shallow. There's a little profile in the uh, above the right-hand photo there, um, and so there often aren't really big differences in energy between different parts of the river. And so therefore the sediment in the channel is pretty similar to the sediment that makes up the bars. In braided rivers, the bars typically move in a process called downstream accretion. And that means that the upstream end of the bar gets eroded, the sediment moves along, and then the sediment gets deposited on the downstream side of the bar, ultimately moving the whole bar gradually down the channel. These erosion and transport and deposition processes only occur when the bar is submerged underneath the flowing water. Bars can also grow laterally or upstream um, but these tend to be less common in, in braided rivers. In, in modern rivers, the bars get lots of different names, like longitudinal bars or lingoid bars, but these, these are often challenging to identify in, in the sedimentary rock record, 
um, especially if you don't really have really extensive outcrop. So we're not going to really worry about the different types of bars in this class. So the other major category of river morphology is the meandering river, named because of its highly sinuous channel that meanders back and forth in these big sweeping bends. Meandering rivers more, more, mostly have a, a single channel that is largely confined within pretty stable banks. The channel does move, me, that's the, the name meandering, um, but it's not nearly as unpredictable and it doesn't shift around as much or as frequently or as, as, as chaotically as braided rivers do. So because the channel is, is quite stable, the overbank area outside of the channel is really clearly separated. And there's even often like a raised bank called a levee at the edge of the channel. So the overbank area has significantly lower energy than the flowing water in the channel. And this sharp and, and pretty major differentiation between the higher energy channel and the lower energy overbank sediments is really a major feature of meandering rivers, one of the most characteristic features in the sedimentary record. So these meandering rivers are also characterized by point bars, which are attached to the inside of the meander bands, labeled in the photo on the right there. Um, and, and so you can compare that, you know, sort of point bar to the, the many, many mid-channel bars that we would see in a braided system. Because meandering river channels are typically deeper and also sinuous, the speed of the water flow varies pretty gradually, but also pretty significantly across the channel bed. The current flows faster on the outside of the bend because it has to travel a greater distance around that. And the greater velocity leads to greater shear stress, which we'll talk more about in a future video, against the outer bank. And so you get erosion around the outer end of the bank. The velocity of the water flow will gradually decrease towards the inner side of the bend. And that slower flow on the inner part will lead to deposition of sediment. And that's why we get the point bar. So because of that pattern of erosion on the outside and deposition on the inside, the meander band will grow outwards and the point bar typically grows by lateral accretion, which means that the bar is growing perpendicular to the flow direction. And if you remember, in braided rivers, they typically grow by downstream accretion. So this is also a pretty major distinction between the two types of rivers. Meandering river systems can also include another distinctive feature that arises because of this separation between channel and overbank. In this photo, the kind of swampy areas are the overbank and the light blue channel is, is the main river. So there can be a raised levee, which here has the trees growing along it, along it. So if the water happens to break through that levee, for example, during a flood, it can rush out pretty quickly into the overbank area, spreading out and creating a fan-shaped deposit called a crevasse splay deposit. And so this provides us a good opportunity to think about how and where we would expect to see different energy levels in this process. So the overbank area is normally characterized by sediment deposited by very, very low energy water ponds or swamps or often just standing water that's not moving after a flood, for example. So that means that the abrupt influx of water through this break in the levee would be a very major and also very abrupt and rapid increase in energy from very, very low to pretty high energy. But as the water spreads out away from this point and fans outwards, we'd also expect the energy to gradually decrease from that the source area away to the edge of it. So we'll discuss in, in the next class how the type of sediment that we see and the sedimentary structures that we see are, are fundamentally controlled by the speed of the water, but it's really valuable to think about how the energy might vary in different parts of the river system so that we can start to predict what we might expect to find. So just to wrap up, although braided rivers and meandering rivers are the two most important types of river morphology, there really is a continuum of river, of river types and there's also different types. There's anastomosing rivers and other ones that we won't really talk about. And one also final word of caution, rivers are, can be quite large systems. Uh, sometimes floodplains can be kilometers across, but most outcrops that you're really gonna ever be able to look at are quite small, tens of meters, maybe hundreds of meters. Uh, you know, this, this photo shows an, sort of ex, an extreme case where this is an enormous river, but it's really important to remember that you know, you're trying to piece together 
a system from small bits of uh, small snapshots of, of information. And so it might require careful observation. It might require integration of multiple outcrops if you really want to reconstruct the entire river system from the small windows that you end up having. 